Bangladesh is exceptionally rich in its 25 yeah. centuries of archaeological okay. heritage. Our archaeological treasures have different facets, which include the small artifacts of prehistoric days, as well as the impressive monuments of the historical era. I the will just sit for five minutes and then we will go for to the diversity of race and religion of the ancient people credited for these historic sites, the vestiges of the Hindus, Buddhists, Christians, Muslims, and the Neolithic people. Though the archaeological remains are spread all over Bangladesh, the country's northern and eastern regions are richer with the oldest treasures. Of the historical age, the earliest archaeological remains are at Mohasthan in Bogura district and Wari Bhateshwar in Noshingdi district. The extensive archaeological remains in the north represent Pundranagar, the earliest urban center of Bengal. The provincial capital of Pundravardhan Bhokti was built here by the Mauryas in the 3rd century BC over the earlier remains of 4th and 5th century BC. The city further flourished in the succeeding regimes of the Guptas, the Senas and the Muslims. The oblong fortified city measures about 1700 by 1400 meters and is protected by walls on its four sides. The city's defense was reinforced by a moat on its north, south and west, while the Korotwa, then a mighty river that is almost dried up now, protected the eastern side. The northeastern corner of the city has a sprawling site, which is locally known as Jahazghata, meaning an anchorage. The city also houses the King Porshuram's palace. On the double bend of the Korotua and outside the northern rampart wall of the city are the remains of the Govindabhita temple, a complex built over four major phases, commencing from the Gupta period. A kilometer southwest of the citadel, there are the spectacular remains of Gokulmer, traditionally known as Lokindarer Mer, or Behular Bashurkar. And beyond the Boshu Bihar is a complex of a twin monastery and a temple. Eastern region lies a city of the early historic period, the twin village of Wari Bhateshwar in the district of Noshingli. This archaeological site is rich with a wide variety of architectural remains and cultural relics. Most spectacular among the early medieval remains is the huge temple and monastery known as Shompur Mohabihara at Paharpur in Naugao district. One of the world cultural heritage sites in Bangladesh, this second largest single monastery south of the Himalayas was established by Dharmapala, the great Pala emperor in the 8th century. The oblong monastery measures 281 by 280 meters and consists of 177 monastic cells in its four wings, with an imposing gateway complex in the middle of the northern wing. In the center of the vast open yard of the monastery stands a lofty shrine. A mondopa and an antechamber were built on each side in the form of projection.
the ambulatory passage with the parapet wall runs parallel to the outline. Apart from the central shrine in the courtyard, there are the remains of many other ancillary buildings. The important ones include a number of votive stupas, a model of central temple, the five Poncho Vedi shrines, kitchen and refectory, administrative buildings and wells. The basement wall of the temple is embellished with 63 stone images. The wall is decorated on the outer face by projecting cornices of ornamental bricks and terracotta plaques set in panels. These plaques represent the folk art of the then Bengal covering images of Buddhist and Brahminical deities, mythology, divine, semi-divine and living beings, as well as fauna and flora. A cluster of structural remains locally called Satya Pirbhita stands about 300 meters east of the monastery. The Bhita consists of a Tara temple and a large number of votive stupas around it. A more ancient temple of a similar architectural configuration has been exposed at Bharat Vaina in Jessore district. This striking style of temple architecture largely influenced the subsequent architectural development of the Far East. A similar monastery, known as Shalbon Vihara, has been exposed in the Lalmai Moinamoti Hill Range in Kumilla district. It is yet a I actually wanted to give you some glimpses about the major religions which are present in my part, in Bangladesh, in my part of the world, which is, of course, we have more than 80% of the population of Bangladesh who, are, who belongs to Islam but we have big majority who belongs to Hinduism and Buddhism. Plus, we have almost two million Christians. So why I showed you these things, that over the centuries, people in our part of the world, whether it was Bengal or today's Bangladesh, how they lived peacefully, and at the same time, they used the soft way of dealing with issues over centuries. It's very important to see, you have seen, temples of Hindus as well as temples or pagodas which were related to Buddhist people. I didn't show you for time constraint uh, the Islamic architecture, but it was coming. During our uh, you know, interval, we will continue with the rest. But thank you very much. I first of all thank the Institute for giving us an opportunity to share Bangladesh's views on this very important topic of the use of the, the soft approach to solve international situation, especially which are conflict ridden. And uh, Mark, thank you very much for inviting me to be present here this morning. Uh, actually, today's world to us, people from Bangladesh, is a very, very digital based world. It is based on the sensitiveness of media and the sensitiveness of which relates to human rights, women empowerment, social justice, rule of law, good governance, all these things, which was not there only 100 years back. Many countries thrived at that time on their empires based on colonies. And then there was a great, in the last 200 years, there was a great emergence of business and trade, and of course, everything came out of industrial revolution. But now, just now, in the last 20 or 30 years, it is more IT, more media, and more sensitiveness towards rights of various people belonging to the society. 
So this topic, which we are discussing today or touching upon, is very, very important. And the topic relates to how to approach situation, not in a hard fashion, but diplomacy should be through soft approach, especially in this specific time of human civilization. Now, if we take into consideration, before I go to Bangladesh itself, the situation in the Middle East, West Asia, without naming any country, or South Asia, we will see many of the problems have become more tougher because there was a hard approach. Hard approach means here, I mean military approach, or even the politics was quite harsh. Rather than going through education or cultural diplomacy. And that's why when we come to this institute and take into consideration the soft approach, I feel really good. Because as you knew that we also had a similar problem, a long standing problem in Bangladesh. When we were a part of Pakistan, actually, uh, something was built in the hill tracks area of Bangladesh. It was to de develop electricity. We built a massive hydroelectric uh, powerhouse. And to do that, we had to replace, to get hydropower, we had to replace many tribal people. And then there was a big problem from the late 50s, or you can say early 60s, till the late 1990s of last century, that the tribal people were so offended of that approach that without talking to them, without taking into consideration their opinion, at that time, the then rulers, at that, it was a military rule in, during Pakistan time, they just did it according to their will. At that time, they didn't take into consideration what should have been done like in modern time. So for over, uh, around from uh, early 60s to late now, around 40 years, there was big disturbance in that particular area of Chittagang Hill Tracks. But when this current Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, the eldest daughter of the founder of Bangladesh, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, came to power for the first time as prime minister. She took it upon herself and went for the soft approach, started negotiating with the tribal people. And then this problem was solved. And in 1998, you all know, she got the UNESCO Peace Award. This is the Bangladesh approach. We believe that the right settlement and to solve problems, always taking into consideration the people who will be affected, and then also taking other similar issues around the world into consideration when you are solving problems in your own country. These are the right approach, rather than just trying to solve it militarily or through harsh political measures. And she was very successful. Now we have peace, good local government, and a lot of development works going on Chittagong Hill Tracks. I just wanted to bring to your notice a big success story for which Bangladesh was recognized by UNESCO in 1998. Our Prime Minister got the UNESCO Peace Award. Secondly, I wanted to talk to you about Bangladesh's role both in the UN Security Council as well as as a UN peacekeeping force provider. We, as a new nation, we are the new, most new country in South Asia because we started our journey as a new country in, 19, uh, in December, on 16 December 1971. Only 40 years back, we started as an independent nation. But within that time, we have already been elected twice for our good work, for our commitment towards peace to the UN Security Council. And not just only peace, for world security. And that means security in any part of the globe. We were there in the early 80s, and we were there just during the 9-11, 2000, 2001. We were in the Security Council, and you have seen our role. But our uh, most glorious role is at the largest provider of peacekeeping force on earth. We are the number one provider from Bangladesh. So you can see our commitment, and it is in all UN missions. Almost all UN missions you will find Bangladeshi people. Either they come from the military, or they come from the police, law enforcement agencies. So these are the things, and we believe wherever we go, we do it in a peaceful way. How, you will say, I will just give an example of Sierra Leone. When there was a big civil war situation in Sierra Leone, a massive contingent went to solve the problem from Bangladesh. And they became, they took the soft approach and they became so 
intertwined with all of their day-to-day uh, -day life activities, that even they built roads and highways, schools. They, the local people even started loving them so much, they started learning our language, Bangla, which is the sixth large spoke, largest spoken language on earth, spoken by 280 million plus people. 280 million plus people. Only Bangladesh is 162 million, but there are other provinces where every in Indian subcon where people also speak Bangla, and there are parts of Nepal where they also understand Bangla, and there are a big non-resident Bengali community all over the world. But that's not the question. The main thing, as I said, in Sierra Leone, we became so popular that Bangla became the second language of Sierra Leone, and they were very happy. Still today, wherever I meet somebody from Sierra Leone, whether it's a diplomat or a general public, they thank us for our role, the soft approach to solve the problem and work for the development of that particular country in Africa. So these are good approaches because we already know that just bombing mountains, you will not bring solution or peace somewhere. I'm not mentioning any country you can understand <laughs> what I'm hinting, uh, or which country I'm hinting at. Bombing mountains, but rather than go there through education, go there through culture, try to understand their religious demands, try to understand their education need for the time, and then come to a midway. Try to solve the problem by understanding them, doing inter-religious dialogue, doing intercultural dialogue. And as an active diplomat in this particular field, not just as an ambassador of peace or a career diplomat, I also had the opportunity to be present during many of the meetings of the UN Alliance of Civilization, both at the summit level and at the small committee levels. This is a new approach, you know. This approach started in 2007 in uh, uh, Spain. It was jointly done by Spain and Turkey, but the leadership has gone to the former Portuguese president, who is the leader of the UN Alliance of Civilization, supported actively, supported by the United Nations. And they also have this soft approach. They also are emphasizing that we should try to solve big problems in the world which are long lasting, for a, which are there for a long time, not by military means or harsh political decisions, but by soft approach. And by soft approach, Bangladesh appreciates, as I wanted to tell you, and I want to reiterate again, good education, understanding of the culture, where the problem is there, and also trying to introduce, even if you want to modernize them, in a soft way through education and understanding and dialogue, not through order, not through military means. Also, we should keep in mind, this is the world where now we are having a lot of digitalization. And Bangladesh is one of the country which has a vision that by the year 2021, Bangladesh will graduate because we are doing very well economically, as you know. We are among the 11 emerging countries of the world now. And our economic growth for the last 10 years is around 6%. This year it will go to 7 and hopefully by 2014 it will be like China, 10% economic growth. And also, we should know with 162 million people, when we started only with six universities and 67% of the people under poverty, now we have 84 universities and less than 30% of the people of such a big population under poverty. It was just, I'm quoting the recent one, only from last week. So how did we do it? Soft approach, going to the people, listening to them, and trying to solve problems within the country or globally through this means, good education, cultural understanding, and dialogue. So this uh, 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 approach or this initiative of the Institute to promote this soft approach to solve long-standing problems as well as crucial problems around the globe, we welcome very much at the initiative of Mark and his institute. And as I was just mentioning, Bangladesh with such a big population has the vision of by 2021 with all the economic developments they are undertaking now, development work, to graduate from LDC to a mid-level developed country, and also through digitalization of the government functions plus the education system. And for that, we are soliciting help from friendly nations, and we are already getting it and doing quite well. You'll be happy to learn that in Bangladesh, media is free. We have more than 150 dailies, and we have more than 11 TV channels. 
and which are through satellite broadcast all over the world. So off with all these things, we are trying to reach the people in a big way. So I will not take much time because it was, I just wanted to give you some example of success of Bangladesh using this soft approach. And I will now welcome if there are any specific questions because Mark requested me to be very short, otherwise I had a long thing, I just made it short. And I want to give you more time, at least five to seven minutes for question and answer and then we can have some food from Bangladesh while we will see rest of the beautiful antiquities, oriental antiquities in Bangladesh. I thank you, thank you. Well, thank you very, very much. That was an excellent presentation. I appreciate also the efficiency. I think in a very limited amount of time, we covered some excellent examples, and I wish actually there were more examples that we could point to in the world, such as Bangladesh. I think really, obviously, uh, you know my own bias as director of the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy, but I really you. think you know these are the kinds of solutions that are going to be much more sustainable for all of us in the interdependent context that we live in. Absolutely. Um, so it's in the dependent world. Exactly. Exactly. So thank you again very much for that. Please, your questions, your comments. Please. Uh, already here in the front. And as always, introduce yourself, please. Thank you for your speech. My name is Richie. I'm from the UK. Um, sorry, I'm uh, Don't fall. <laughs> <laughs> um, during the conference, we discussed hard and soft power in a number of different contexts. Genocide, conflict, terrorism, and protest, to name a few. Um, I'd like to ask your view on how famine as a phenomenon features into this. Because um, arguably, famine is a result of hard power or harsh politics, as you put it. Uh, to give a positive view, Usually the military is put in charge of distribution of food during a famine. A negative view, it can often be used as a tool for forced migration. Um, so I want to know how can we use soft power as a solution for famine? Thank you. But here also, as you just rightly mentioned, the military is not using their gun. They're using their efficient uh, training system as well as the uh, materials that they have at their disposal like the trucks and other things to efficiently distribute the you know, food and other things they need to face the famine. So even military can be used as a tool of soft approach. I was in a meeting, I can share with you, where the NATO, one of the you know, NATO uh, admirals were present. And he also opined that in some of the cases, he believes education and cultural understanding, development of cultural understanding, is even better than sending marines. That was, it's coming from, I will not name him because of you know, confidentiality, but he, I was present there from my background in international diplomacy in one of his presentation, that he also is in favor of cultural diplomacy and soft approach, especially through education and Going, to in, uh, going through individual and collective approach to meet the people, try to understand their culture, try to understand their need, and then solve it by coming at least in the middle way. Not to be that I want to do this and you have to do it. No, not that harsh approach, not that harsh political decision. I'm giving you from one of the NATO admirals, one of the chiefs. So this will be my approach because in Bangladesh, when we have floods, our military, they just go there, they help them, they do it as a trained citizen of the country. They don't go it like a very, to flex their muscle. So that is totally different. Military can be also very soft in their approach. For famine and flood both. Next Please. question, advisory Absolutely. board member. The honorable former president. Your Excellency, am I right in assuming that uh, soft power runs very much parallel to Hinduism and uh, to the philosophy of Mahatma Gandhi? Uh, not, uh, soft power is present not only in one religion. The soft approach is present even in Buddhism, you know, even in you know, other religions as well, which are all existing in Bangladesh. You know, uh, the Buddha, who was the promoter of Buddhism himself was a prince. He gave up his life and didn't become a king because he didn't like, you know, those harsh way of treating people or only enjoying, you know, which we call vogue as a king. 
and not to go to war, not to kill you know, animals, you know, nirvana and other things. So I will not go in detail of Buddhism or Hinduism or Islam, but there are elements of peace in all the religions on earth, or Christianity or Judaism. But as you said correctly, Mahatma Gandhi as a personality, as a leader of South Asia or undivided India, he absolutely was always in favor of peace. And the people of South Asia, they love his teaching, whether it's his, you know, uh, where, from where he came, India, or whether it is the other countries which came out of India after 1947. All of them follow his way, or the people at large, they support their way, his way of peace, doing peace and approaching softly. You know, even he faced the British Empire. I mentioned about the colony, I didn't want to be very specific, but at that time when you talk about history, you have to talk about Britain. Uh, at that time he faced the British Empire without any, even any stick. He went through peace. He went through shottagraha. He went through, uh, you know, uh, fasting. So you know that the approach was totally, totally peaceful. And that was one of the very beginning of soft approach in a massive way. But he started even before India in South Africa. You know that. Thank you very much for asking a very relevant question. Is there a final brief question? <laughs> okay, <and laughs> final brief question. Yes. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Your Excellency. My name is Sabura. Sabura. Mm -hmm. I'm from Germany as well as India. And um, my question would be, since you're so enthusiastic about soft power, the usage of soft power in your uh, foreign policy, I'm wondering how do you use it with the major player in the region, which is India? Um, how do you, how do you, what kind of cultural relations uh, do you try to create with India? Or absolutely, you know, obviously absolutely. politically India it's difficult, but uh, how do you use it? it? And uh, that's just one part. And the other part would be how do you use it with Saudi Arabia? Is there any influence or money or Wahhabist influence coming into Bangladesh uh, from there? And uh, how do you tr uh, use that in order, uh, how do you use soft power in order to deter ter terrorism or fundamentalist influences from Saudi Arabia? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, let me start with the second part. Uh, we don't believe that all influences that come from Saudi Arabia are promoting fundamentalism or terrorism, that we don't believe. It is also a very friendly country which supports a lot of Bangladesh people by giving them employment, by supporting you know, many of their works. So I don't agree that approach that Saudi Arabia is promoting that thing, no. Maybe people like who has just passed away, who hailed from that country, maybe he was involved with that, but not Saudi Arabia at large. So that's the thing. You will be happy to learn that more than 2 million people from Bangladesh actually work in Saudi Arabia. So we already have a big understanding, and they have a big, you know, I mean, a reliance, or they love our good work of the general people, whether he is a doctor or an engineer or a professor, or whether he's just a cleaner on the street. More than two million people. Many countries don't have even a population of two million from Bangladesh work in Saudi Arabia. So we have a wonderful understanding, and we don't believe that concept that they are promoting anything, number one. Number two, like fundamentalism or terrorism. Our relation with India is excellent. This is 40 years of independence of Bangladesh when I'm you know, addressing you. And India was our first and foremost supporter during the War of Liberation in 1971. Not only in the fields when we were fighting the war, but they had 10 million people from Bangladesh as refugee in, next to the border of India, in West Bengal and other parts. At the same time, late Indira Gandhi, the Honorable Prime Minister of that time, she went from door to door to different superpowers and big powers to bring support in our favor to become an independent country. And her diplomats worked very hard at the UN to secure support within that structure as well. Until today, within the framework of SARC, South Asian Association Regional Cooperation, we have excellent, and that was also initiated by Bangladesh. We have excellent relationship, of course, with India and with other member countries, including Pakistan. But the main thing is with India, we have a big, long border. We have a lot of business. Most of our trade is with first with India, then second with China. Regular trade both ways. But the number one trade in the world destination-wise is Germany. 
in, in the world is USA, and second in, the, in Europe is Germany. I just wanted to mention that. But I will again go back to your first question. With India, since we have been culturally related with them for more than 4,000 years, we were part of the undivided Indian subcontinent and the Hindu rule, Muslim rule, and the British rule. We have, like brothers and cousins, a long-standing understanding. I don't know whether you know that we have even regular bus service and railway service between the two countries. So, and now we are thinking to have a university under the aegis of SARC, which will be inaugurated next year. It was proposed by Dr. Monmon Singh, the Honorable Prime Minister of India. It will start from next year, which is a South Asian center for excellence. So altogether, you can understand how good the relation is. So the approach is already very soft, education and culture oriented, and the understanding is already there. We are now jointly celebrating the 150th birth anniversary of the first Nobel laureate in literature in Asia, Rabindranath Tagore, jointly, India and Bangladesh together. I know you already know that from the TV, because you have seen our Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina inaugurating it in Dhaka with the Indian Vice President, and one of our ministers went and inaugurated it jointly with Sonia Gandhi and Dr. Manmohan Singh in Delhi the second day. So we are so close, but I thank you for a nice question. Thank you. Your Excellency, let us express to you once again our gratitude. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.